Okay, test. It's working now. Okay. I hope you are listening to me. <laughs> you were saying yes, but I don't know. <laughs> so we go from scales of just meters or tens of hundreds of meters to but the whole globe, because at the end of the world traffic system is interconnected. And you go from special uh, temporal scales of seconds, because an air traffic controller has to take decisions in seconds, pilots have to react in seconds, up to years. If you think on regulations or um, policies, European policies on mobility and so forth. So there are plenty of special and temporal scales that we want to analyze. And it's really funny in that sense. Uh, so this is not new, of course, and in our transport, this has been a problem for many years. And uh, what do you do in order to try to solve, to understand the system or to understand this, this behavior? Well, taking into account that our transport comes from engineering, most of the people are engineers. And what do they do? Well, most of the time they just do a simulation or a model, because this is what engineers do, right? I mean, you have a, a machine or something, you do a model of that machine, and then you try to understand how it works. Well. This is okay, but the problem is that it doesn't work very well here. Let me explain why. Uh, following this philosophy, we have a lot of different uh, like uh, simulators or models or softwares in general that you can use, that you can, some of them are even free. Thank you. Uh, some of them you have to pay, most of them you have to pay and quite a lot. And uh, what you can do is that just you download them and you define some conditions and you make a simulation and you see the, the end result. The problem is that when you have so many scales, special and temporal, you have to simulate all these scales, which means that some simulators, some models even try to simulate the movement of individual passengers inside a terminal because this may affect flights and then this may affect other flights and so forth. So you have to do all this. So they try to understand, okay, this passenger will go from this gate, uh, we go through here and we'll arrive there. Uh, as if people were always rational and they won't stop to a store to just get lost and then they discover that their flight is going to leave and then they have to arrive. How can you simulate that? That's, that's essentially impossible. So you do very good, very huge simulations that are based on things that you cannot simulate because you don't have the data, you don't have the understanding of that, and you get some results. Okay, let's suppose that the simulation is really good. What about the results? Well, at the end, what you will have is trajectories of aircraft. You have a bunch of trajectories of aircraft given some initial condition, which is exactly what you have in the real system. In the real system also you have trajectory of aircraft. And then you don't solve the problem because at the end you have once again, a very micro scale description of the system, but you don't see the big picture. You don't see where the interaction came from, where, uh, how they evolve, how they impact the system. So how this, how they say in English, you see the trees, but you lose sight of the forest. So you don't, you just have a bunch, a huge amount of data, but you don't have a clear picture of what is going on. And this is really interesting because actually in, Statistical physics, we have exactly that problem. So what is the basic idea of statistical physics? Well, we have a system that is very complex, but I don't want to focus on the details. I don't want to focus on the single molecule of gas that is in this room. I just want to try to extract some global uh, macro scale rules about how the system evolves and how the system behaves. So not surprising, uh, in the last, I would say, decade, 15 years, maybe 20, stretching it a little bit, statistical physics has started being using to try to understand what's going on in the air transport on different levels. And uh, the idea of this talk is that I just want to give you an overview of the main like topics or the main problems that you can tackle or that have been tackled in air transport, how they have done that, and especially what are the caveats or the problems that you have to be really careful when you when you analyze this data. So maybe tomorrow you have you are working on some tools and you may think, hey, this reminds me of a problem of aeronautics, and then you can go back and and maybe they do something with that. So let's start with something simple. Networks, I uh, assume that all of you are familiar with complex network theory at some degrees at least. Uh, so we, what we can do is that we can reconstruct uh, complex network representations of the traffic of the movement of aircraft in a, in a given region. And uh, the most simple thing that you can do is to create an airport network. That is, okay, I create a network where each node is an airport and I connect pairs of nodes if there is a direct flight between them. 
nothing special, very simple. This actually was done first of all, first for the first time, I think, many years ago in 2005 by Gimera and co worker in this plus that is very famous now, has a lot of citations. And what they did was to take data for the whole uh, globe, all the flights that they have there, put them inside a network, and then calculate a few things. Like, for instance, that you have a scale free degree distribution, more or less, not exactly, but airports are more or less scale free distributed. Uh, you have a distribution of the betweenness that is of the centrality of each airport that is also uh, similar, which essentially means there are some a few airports that are really important and most of the airports that are very small and not really relevant. Then you can calculate communities and you find some interesting things that probably you won't be able to see far away, but essentially that they don't coincide with countries or the ideas that we have of country. So for instance, you have here a small network that is of uh, that is of Canada, but also the network of the US like grows inside Canada somehow. So it's not just, a, of course, a, let's say a political division. Uh, transport does not follow political boundaries most of the time, but there are more forces behind. So they did this analysis, they got some results that were nice. And uh, since then, and now I'm sorry that I didn't put this table longer, but many uh, works came out uh, on similar ideas. So they took different networks, like for different countries, continents, and so forth. They recreated the network and they analyzed it. And uh, this is a review that we did a few years ago, almost 10 years ago, with Fabrizio Lillo. And we found several papers that were doing this kind of airport networks. And, and things start getting a little bit uh, weird. Let's say that way. So you, you won't be able probably to sit there, but okay, there are several studies for the same countries. So for instance, you have US, you have two studies here. China, you have two studies. And then you have the number of nodes and links. And you see that numbers don't coincide. And you may think, well, okay, like for instance, in this case, you have that China had 144 airports in this study and 128 in the other. Okay, it's not a huge difference. It can be that maybe in two years or whatever, they built uh, 10 airports. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because an airport is not that easy to build, but it, it can be done, right? But then there are situations like Italy that went from 33 airports to 42. And that's an increase of 25%. And Italy doesn't have a lot of money to build the airports. So, I mean, it's like, what? I mean, this is getting weird. And then you see here this specific line you have us and austria so us 272 airports yeah it makes sense austria not australia austria the small country 138 so according to this study austria has half of the airports of the us really and then you see the number of connections so the number of direct flights uh, for the us is uh, 6000 and for uh, austria is 9000 what? <laughs> so Austria has more flights than, and actually, according to, if you keep comparing, you have that China has one eighth of the number of flights of Austria. That doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, there is something wrong here. And here we come to the first point or the first problem that I've seen a lot of times, because it's very simple to take a data set. You know about networks, you know about things like that. You take a data set, you know some tools, you apply them, and you get some results. Yeah, well, the, the problem is that working with data in a transport, but I would say in any field, you have to know your data. You have to be very careful with the data that you are using. And in a transport, even if it seems like uh, weird, even defining what a basic concept, like what an airport is or what a flight is, is not that simple as it seems. So for instance, airports, we know the definition of an airport. You can more or less picture an airport, right? I mean, it's not difficult, but uh, are we sure that we have to include all the airports inside? So, for instance, a couple of examples from Spain. You have Ciudad Real, the famous or infamous airport of Ciudad Real, that for those of you that are not Spanish, they, they created a full airport, a very huge airport, and no one was flying there. They received not a single flight because no one wanted to fly to Ciudad Real. I don't know. So, you have high speed trains, so probably it was not that, but whatever. They built this airport and was completely useless and no flights at all. So uh, do you include this airport inside the, your network, even if it has no connection? Probably not. Another example, Casa Rubio de Monte, which is near Madrid in the southwestern part. Uh, 
it's a, actually a nice, I mean, I won't call it an airport. It's a nice place, airfield, if you want, where uh, most actually all flights that go there are just private flights. You have your own like small aircraft, especially gliders or acrobatic flights or things like that. They all uh, take off from there. And this is a nice airport, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have even a, a control tower. So you just go and you land and it's quite funny. I can tell you that because I did that. And it's kind of, you know, you, you just go blindly and you, you are with the radio, hey, anyone is here because I'm going to land. <laughs> so, but it's an airport, technically it's an airport inside the uh, Spanish system. It has an ICAO code, is recognized as an airport and so forth. So technically, yes, it's an airport. Do we want to include this inside our network? Maybe not. Uh, and in any case, do we have to consider all the airports? So let's suppose that I want to check mobility in Europe and I create a network with the 100 largest uh, airports in Europe. That's quite enough, right? I mean, 100 airports, you have for sure the big ones and also some small ones. Yeah, and why not 150 or 200? And probably if you change this number, the weight topology of the network will change. So you have to be careful why you decide to use some data and not others and which one to delete. Uh, going to flights, I mean, flights is in principle quite easy. I mean, you have an aircraft, so you, you see the flight, but there are several types of flight. So like you can have regular flights like Iberia that every day has a flight from Madrid to Palma. That's a regular flight. You have scheduled flights that are not regular. For instance, you can have a, a touristic operator that decides in the summer to put a flight from somewhere to Palma just to bring tourists. That's a flight, but it's not regular. And then you have private flights. I mean, you can have someone, but as if you have enough money, you buy a citation and you just fly wherever you want. Is that a flight? It depends, because if you are looking at mobility in Europe, well, this citation that brings a couple of people is not really important, right? It's not the solution is not to put more citations around. I mean, that's not the way to increase uh, mobility. So you may think, no, this type of flights, we have to delete them. Uh, but think from the point of view of the airport. This aircraft is exactly the same as any other aircraft. So when it will arrive, we will use runway. You have to ensure separation. You have to give the same services. You have to give like a place to park and so forth. So from the point of view of the airport, this aircraft is essentially is exactly the same as any other flight. And then what is a flight? Well, it depends. If you're looking at mobility is one thing. If you're looking at just interactions, uh, traffic and so forth is another one. You have to be very careful with what data you put inside. So uh, going to, uh, one bit further on these ideas, uh, a few years ago, what we did with some colleagues was to try to analyze the multi-scale structure of this network. And the idea was, okay, if we are looking at mobility, let's consider the city of London. They have four airports. Actually, I think they have more, but the big ones are four. Uh, does it make sense to consider that those as four nodes or would it make more sense from a point of view of mobility of just merge all the four nodes into one single node that is London? Because if you want to go to London, you don't really care if you, you are landing at Heathrow, uh, Luton and so forth. You just go to London. Okay, then it might be more or less convenient to, to get to the city, but essentially it's the same. So what we did was to try this multi-level representation in which we merged airports according to different rules, usually based on distance. So for instance, what we could do is something like that. Okay, now you won't see it, I'm sorry about that. But essentially here we have individual airports and then we have cities and then we have 100 and 200 like uh, radii. So we merge all the airports that are within a given radius that can be changed. Then we have regions and we have countries. Uh, and then we calculated the centrality of the resulting nodes in the network and we tried to compare them. And it's quite interesting because I mean, there are results that are easy to understand. Like for instance, this is USA and you have that USA is the most central one is of course is one of the top uh, hubs, let's say in air transport. And then we have different airports like this was uh, Los Angeles and JFK, uh, New York, that are also important. So you have airports that are important and they merge together in a country that is also important. But it's not always the case. So for instance, here you have Turkey. No, sorry, this is Turkey, this here. 
Turkey is a hub because you have a lot of flights that go in and out. And also the region, especially this is the 200 kilometer regions around essentially Istanbul is also very important and very central. But if we go down in the, in the spatial scale, we don't see individual airports. So the point is that you can have one airport or a couple of airports that are not that big themselves, but when they are merged, then they become important. So Istanbul as a city is important from the point of view of mobility, of connectivity, but not individual airports of Istanbul. Just to clarify, this was a couple of years ago, and therefore we were, uh, there was uh, one sm small, more or less a small airport in the center of Istanbul, that was Istanbul Ataturk. Now it's completely different because they built another huge airport outside the city, so this data will, will for sure change. And also Turkish airline was not such a big uh, airline in that time, it was still growing. So for sure these figures will be different, but just for you to understand that there are different scales, that it's not as simple as to say an airport is a node. We can go uh, more to do more interesting things. So to, to close a little bit to this first part, uh, this is, I think, a one important question. This is nice from a statistical physics point of view. Also, you have to think 2005, complex network theory was fairly new. So, you know, it, it was something new and therefore you found it about air transport and you discovered that the air transport network is scale-free. That was a result in itself because they did, we didn't know that everything was scale-free. Now, although we know that essentially almost any network is scale-free or, I mean, or according to some people, none of them are scale-free, depending on how you define scale-freeness and so forth. But, okay, but the point is that uh, that time it was new and it was a good example of the use of statistical physics to study something. But what, are our, what about the other way around? Is there, are these results useful from a, a, a transport point of view? Not much, to be honest. Because what you can do with these kind of networks, uh, you can describe the system. Great, okay. I mean, yeah, it's a network. So what? Um, and then there is a second point that many papers tried to, to exploit or try to go deeper into that. And this is the, the topic of resilience. So if you have a network, there are a lot of theories about how you can calculate the resilience of the system, identify which are the nodes that are more critical and so forth. So, okay, let's try to do the same with our transport and with this airport network. There are a couple of problems. First of all, as we have seen, data availability, we don't have all the data and we have to be careful with the data that we use, uh, especially because we don't have, I mean, it's quite difficult to get some data like passenger connectivity. That is, I'm a passenger, I take this first flight to go to a place and then take a second flight. That's not that easy to, to get this kind of information. And uh, but there are even information that is almost impossible to get, like for instance, policies of Ireland for uh, rescheduling passengers if there are problems in one airport. Uh, these are policies that are inside each airline that they decide these are not published. You cannot download them from the internet or whatever. You can try to go to each and Ireland and ask them, hey, can you give me the data? Maybe if you have some friends there, you can do that, but usually it's almost impossible to get this kind of information. But so the, the representation that we do of the system of, of the resilience is limited because of this. But most important point, I think, is actionability. And this is something that, of course, in air transport is very important. So, okay, you are telling me that I analyze the network of Spain and uh, I get that uh, Madrid Barajas is, of course, a hub, is a very large airport, and uh, therefore is very vulnerable. And then what can I do with that? Can I really change the system according to the information that I extracted? So can I go like the government, go to Iberia and say, hey, I know that you have a lot of flights that go to Madrid and you are making a lot of money. Well, not now, but you were, you used to make a lot of money before COVID and all of that. Um, but we see that this is very like unstable, it's not very resilient. Can you please reschedule your flight? I know that people don't want to, to fly to Vigo, but please put flights there because so, of course you cannot. I mean, and even if you could, does it make sense? Because an event that affects a whole airport is like one every 20 years. I mean, imagine closed down completely Barajas. I mean, something huge has to happen. Last time I remember something like that was the, the accident of um, uh, Spanair. 
And that was not even completely closed. The airport was closed like for a few hours or something like that. So, I mean, some, it must be something huge. And then to prepare for something that might happen 20 years in the future, you impact and you destroy the mobility in Spain just putting flights that make no sense. No, this is not going to, you won't sell this to a politician and uh, to, I mean, I guess to anyone, not even passengers. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, the, the most important point that it's very nice to do things with statistical physics. This is a very rich playground. You can do a lot of things, but also you have to take into account that this has to have an impact. It must be useful in some way. And you have to be careful with that. It's not, it's not that simple. Uh, okay, let's go one, one step further. Uh, we have seen a, a network of airports. So nodes were airports and we connect them when there is a direct flight. So, but the problem is that a flight is not something that you can do in, on a straight line. That is, you don't take off from an airport and then I want to go there and therefore I go on a straight line directly to that airport. You cannot do that. You have to follow some airways. Uh, the easiest way to understand this is like streets in a city, you cannot, I mean, if you want to go to a place, you cannot just take your car and just drive straight ahead through buildings or whatever. Uh, you have to follow the streets that you have in the city. Something similar happens in our transport. So for instance, if you want to go from Seville to Palma, there are a set of uh, 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 waypoints that are points that are defined in space that you have to follow in order to reach your destination. And usually there is like a, a very good solution, very close to the ideal straight line, but you cannot go on a straight line. You have to follow these waypoints. And why is that? Well, first of all, it's because of safety, because this simplifies the flows of aircraft in the airspace, and therefore air traffic controllers have a much easier, I mean, they have an easier job managing all the, all the flights. And second, even for, because of an historic one. So this started like almost 100 years ago, at the beginning in the US, this, there was this uh, mail, air mail service uh, that was like the first real application of air transport, in which there were aircraft, like very old biplanes, aircraft, real aircraft flying, and they had to fly that night to bring mail from one city to another. But of course, they didn't have the technology, they didn't have GPS, uh, whatever. I mean, not even in some cases, not even radio. Uh, so what they did was to build these towers with lights on top, literally, and to create like lines of these uh, lights throughout the countries. So you could take off and just follow the light and reach your destination. This was the real flying thing, not today. I mean, today is a, is a game compared to that. And actually, I'm, I think that the, the survival, like the life expectancy of pilots there was awful. Imagine flying without any technology, without just following light. And if there is a cloud, Good luck. Uh, so nowadays we don't use that. We have like other technologies. We have GPS and all of that. But well, GPS is a little bit more complicated, but we have other technologies, but still we have to follow these uh, routes in the in uh, these streets in the um, in the sky. So what we can do is take these waypoints and create a network where each node is one of these waypoints, and we connect pairs of them if I can go if there is a route between them, if I can go from one uh, waypoint to the next. Uh, actually, this is a work that some friends of mine did. And here you have a representation of the network in Europe. So as you can see, it's very dense because they try to, to give you as many alternatives or possibilities as possible. So this network is really like dense and really connected. Even if you zoom in into Germany, it's still a mess because there are a lot of airways. And then here there is a nice example from going to, what is this? Uh, Frankfurt, I think, to Hamburg. And this is a very good example of not a straight line. Here you have to reroute a lot on the, on the east to go there. Uh, they analyzed the network and they found some properties that are quite uh, as you would expect. Like for instance, that the, that the number of, uh, the, the degree is much lower than the airport network. Of course, because in an airport, you can have flights coming from hundreds of different destinations. But here in this network, you don't want too many flights coming from different directions because the idea is exactly to organize flights, the flows of aircraft, such that the air traffic controller has an easier job. So you want to limit the degree around these nodes. Um, and things like that. So they made some uh, topological analysis. 
this is a work uh, that a student of mine, now PhD student of mine, has been doing recently. Here you have uh, well, clustering coefficient and um, uh, characteristic path length of the network. And here in blue, you have a set of uh, airport networks. And here you have examples of root networks. As you might expect, you don't have many triangles because triangles in a root network, I mean, they are good because they are a kind of redundancy, but also they don't make any sense because usually aircraft don't want to loop around. So you just want to go in a straight line. So you try to avoid uh, somehow triangles. But of course, you have a much longer uh, path length because it's not just that you start here and you go there. You have to take usually 10 or 20 waypoints in the middle to reach your destination, depending how long your flight is. And what we did it was a study uh, it was quite surprising in some sense. We did the same. We analyzed the, the structure of the European uh, uh, root network or uh, waypoint network, uh, but we did this through time. Now, one thing that everyone, I think, in the field thought is that this network never changes. Because if you think about that, it's like the network of streets in a city. You can change it, but it's not simple. And especially this will include, it will create a lot of problems for pilots that they suddenly have a different route that they have to follow. Uh, dispatcher of companies because they have to create new flight plans because the network has changed. Air traffic controllers. I mean, if someday suddenly you have a different structure, you have to learn to manage a completely different uh, traffic pattern and so forth. So, they expected this network to not evolve. And actually, it's very interesting that we found in some papers that they didn't even report the date of uh, to which the network corresponded. So they say, we analyzed the, whatever the European uh, uh, air route network uh, of when. You don't need it to put that because it never changes, right? I mean, what is the difference between one month and the other? Well, actually, what we saw is that the network is very is evolving quite a lot. There is a huge increment in the number of nodes. Uh, there is a decreasing density, which makes sense. And there are some other properties. Also, we have seen some like, kind of pace transition, like some important structural changes at some point in the evolution. But most importantly, we could analyze the resilience. Because now it makes sense. Because first of all, um, if you analyze specific regions of the airspace, uh, things might happen. I mean, just bad weather. I mean, it must be very bad weather, but if you have some very strong weather phenomena, you can close a, a small space, uh, airspace, or you might have to reduce the capacity of that airspace, the number of flights that you have through that. And also you have tools to change the way uh, aircraft go through that because you can limit the number of aircraft that go through a sector or through a waypoint in time, or you can even put taxes because you have, of course you have to pay taxes when you want to fly just navigation uh, like uh, tax. And you can increase taxes in one place if you think that the, you want aircraft to avoid it. And the airlines will try to avoid that place because they have to pay more taxes and therefore they will find new solutions. So in this case, it makes sense. And of course, the result that we got is not surprisingly, the center of Europe is like the most vulnerable part. Most of the time, just because there are there is a lot of traffic going through there. So here you have like France, Germany. So all flights going from France to Germany, from UK to Europe, and even intercontinental flights that arrive from the US will go through here. So this part here is quite a mess. You have a lot of flights, a lot of traffic, and therefore not surprising that there are a lot of, uh, let's say, vulnerable points. If you just delete some points, you will have a huge problem in the in the network. So uh, ah, one last point, and this is an idea that I think is very interesting, but has not been like developed a lot in the literature. Actually, I could just essentially found one paper uh, from a conference that was just a couple of pages long, not many details at all, but it is very nice. So what they do is, okay, let's consider all the networks together. We do a multi-layer network in which we have um, the top layer, the airport network, then the air route network, and then the air sector networks. Sectors are like the division of the airspace that are controlled by a single air traffic controller. So you can, in principle, do this. You have like three layers, and you can see how vulnerability or any other property changes depending on the layer that you consider and the interaction between them. Uh, suddenly, I couldn't find any like follow-up 
work on this. I don't know if they kept working or maybe I just missed it. So this was just a, let's say, a preview in a conference. And the idea was quite nice, but I couldn't find any more information about this. Okay, so this is, let's say, the first part. Do you have any questions about this while I take work? What about the waypoints? Are there actual intersections? Yeah. Suppose if you want to go somewhere, like a road network, so you wouldn't have like almost parallel routes. Come on. Have exactly, you have intersection, otherwise it would be too easy. You just follow your yeah, yeah. exactly, and that's where problems happen. Actually, we have the traffic control hub to really work, and actually there are a kind of intersection that you cannot avoid at all, and is near the airport because everyone wants to land, and so when you arrive at the airport, you have like the convergence of a lot of different routes. What is it? Like? What is the waypoint? Uh, no, physically it can be nothing. A waypoint is just uh, coordinates in the air, and usually we are defined either by just coordinate like GPS coordinate, or uh, using uh, radio nav aids. There are some, uh, let's say, some transmitters, radio transmitters that give you information that you can use to know where you are. I can go more into detail, but it's more complicated. <laughs> Should the evolution of the yeah I didn't I didn't see the different uh, forty years yeah this is yeah so I mean it's not that fast it's not that it changes day to day actually it cannot because there are uh, IRAC cycles there are cycles of twenty eight days in which yeah I mean if you want to make a change you have to notify it and it will ap apply the next cycle so the next twenty eight days but still I mean in four years. Yeah, for real, so you have an increase like in the 30% in the number of waypoints. It's not, uh, I mean, it's not static, that's for sure. <laughs> no, I, I, I forgot to change, but I would put my money on the fact that they included all uh, our landing strip glass whatever something similar probably they included or not some small airport or something like that yeah yeah because i don't think that in italy they can build so many i mean they tried in spain and it was a disaster and it was just one <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to create a new airport especially because i mean if you don't have people that want to go there then airlines don't want to go there and then why you have uh, that actually the airport of Ciudad Real recently had a lot of traffic and this was a completely uh, a problem because with COVID, they decided to use the airport as just a place to park aircraft that airlines were not operating. So actually in the photo that I had, there were like a huge line of aircraft, not because they were flying, just they were parked there. And uh, at least they used that for something. That's good. <laughs> Well, you, there are several ways, but essentially imagine that you delete one node, you calculate the average distance between all pairs of airports, and then you delete one node and you see how much this will increase. And then you select the airport that would uh, imply uh, the largest increase of, uh, of distance. But this is a very simple... Yeah, the point is that it's very simple because, for instance, you don't consider the number of passengers that go in every flight. That is very important. The problem is that getting the number of passengers is not that easy because this information is from the airlines and we can talk a lot about that. It's, very, it's a very nice topic, but yeah. Any more questions? I'm actually super late. With so I will try to go a little bit to the next topic. And uh, if I have time, we will see the third and the fourth, but whatever. So um, let's go from explicit to functional networks. Uh, first of all, why, why do, what do I mean by explicit? By explicit, I mean that in the networks that we have seen before, you don't have actually to reconstruct the network because the network is there, it's explicit. You just have to take the information and put it in the network. That is, airports are there, there are no doubts about what an airport, more or less about what an airport is. And if there is a flight between two airports, you just go to the web page or whatever of the airlines and you see if there is a, a flight. There's nothing more than that. You don't have to reconstruct anything. 
because the information is there and is more or less explicit. But there are some situations in which we don't have this explicit information, but we want to recover it from usually from data. So what is the problem, more, more generally speaking? Why would we want to use these, uh, these techniques? Well, let's consider the problem of delays. Delays, I mean, if you have been planning in the last months, probably you suffered some delays. Uh, two years ago, it was wonderful because of COVID. Essentially, there were no flights, therefore there were no delays. It was wonderful. And before that, if you remember, in 2018, the situation was actually quite dire. There were a lot of delays in Europe, and this was a huge problem, also in the US. Um, why do we care about delays? Well, delays are bad, of course, because you don't want to delay when you fly. They have a negative impact on the image of our transport because, uh, I mean, we all know that if I have a meeting at four and I have a flight that should arrive at three, I should not take that flight. I have to take a previous flight because for sure it will be delayed and therefore I will miss my meeting. And this is something that doesn't happen, for instance, with high speed train or even metro here or whatever. So the point is that there is this negative idea of air transport. If you take the aircraft, you will arrive late because there are always delays, almost always. But also it has a huge uh, economic cost, as you can imagine. And uh, I did some data and uh, for, I think this was for year 2018, if I'm not wrong, the cost of delays in the US were $22 billion, which is a huge quantity if you think about that. But it's even, Larger, if you think that in Spain in 2017, the cost of the world national healthcare system was 72 billion euros. So if you could get rid of delays, like in Europe or in the US, uh, we will have enough money to pay one third of like healthcare system of Spain. So we're talking about big numbers. And actually I also calculated that that amount was the same as the domestic product of a country like Slovenia something like that. So a small country, of course, but you are, we are losing, we are wasting money in a quantity that is the same as a small country, of all the production, the production of a small country. So it's a lot of money that we are losing there. Plus, of course, if you have aircraft flying around, they are emitting carbon dioxide, which is, uh, of course, is polluting. You have, you know, all of these problems. So you want to, to try to avoid the delays. Uh, if, I mean, at all cost or almost at all cost. But the problem is even more complicated because we can more or less distinguish two types of delays. Uh, standard delays, let's call them standard and reactionary delays. Reactionary delays is when one delay that appears because of whatever is propagating to other flights. So this is the typical thing when you go to your gate to take a flight and they say, we are sorry, your flight is delayed because of the late arrival of the previous flight. So is the previous flight that has a delay and because of that, they are delayed and therefore your flight is also delayed. Your flight has no, no fault in that. I mean, it's not its a responsibility. It's just the aircraft arrived late. So you have one single delay that starts propagating and like uh, multiplying usually, uh, which is by the way, something quite that I found quite disturbing the fact that they say that because it's like, that's not an that's not a reason. That's an excuse. It's like to say, sorry, I arrived here late because I left late from my home. Yeah, that's my problem. I mean, I should have, I mean, that's not a reason for a delay. It's just an excuse that they give, but not the reason. Now, why is this important? Because primary delays, uh, in many cases, we cannot get rid of them. And in some cases, we don't want to get rid of them. But reactionary delays are always bad. It's something that we could easily get to, I mean, not easily, but we want to get rid of because they make no sense. They have no meaning. Uh, just to put a, there is an, an example that I always use, and it's, can we get rid of some delays? Yes. Do we want to get rid of them? Not necessarily. Imagine that you are flying, that you are uh, arriving at an airport, you, you are in the approach phase, and suddenly there is, I mean, suddenly there is there a uh, weather, bad weather, like think on a huge cloud, uh, cumulonimbus, black, and so forth, very nasty. Well, what can you do about that? Well, the first option is that you take a deviation, you reroute, you go around the weather phenomenon, and then you land. And you lose maybe 15 minutes, and you have 15 minutes of delays. Is this bad? Yes. Is there an alternative? Of course, you just fly in the middle of the cloud. The aircraft is perfectly capable to handle that and some more without any problem. 
And passengers will be like probably the time of their life, like bouncing around and, you know, like. <laughs> so, do we really want to get rid of that delay? We could, but it's not a bad delay, right? I mean, it's in exchange of something, of safety if you want, and especially of comfort. So, not all delays are bad, but only reactionary delays are bad, because these secondary delays have no meaning. I mean, it's something that is wrong in the system and that we have to take, uh, to, to try to eliminate. And the problem is that, according to like statistics of every year, because the situation doesn't improve, half of the delays are reactionary. So, in fact, half of the delays probably have a reason, and probably we cannot get rid of them. But half of them are completely useless, and we could save a lot of money, like eleven billion dollars. It's not a bad, a bad, a bad idea to save that. Now, what is the problem? That uh, ah, okay, the. Okay, what, what are the causes of reactionary delays? Well, to put it simple, late arrival of the previous aircraft, but also you can have connecting passengers. So you have a group of passengers that go in business class that arrive with one flight, but this flight is late, and then they have to take another flight. Probably the airline will wait, will delay the second flight because I mean, they are business passengers, they paid a lot of money. So, you know, there is also a reputation cost there. So they, they probably want to wait for them. Connecting crews, this can also happen in which you have one crew that is flying one aircraft and then they have to change an aircraft to another aircraft. If they are late, it will also affect and so forth. There are several causes. And the, the question that you might ask is, why don't we uh, why don't we study it? I mean, it's not that difficult, right? Well, actually, it's difficult because this is a, the typical example of a macro scale phenomena because it's a, a phenomenon that affects the world dynamics of the system at a global level that emerges from very small interactions. I mean, interaction at a small scale between individual aircraft, between individual crews, and so forth. So it's like the typical problem that we have in statistical physics. You see something emerging in the global like uh, layer, but you don't really understand what's going on in the micro scale. We don't have usually enough data to understand that, and therefore the assimilation is usually not a solution, as I explained before, because we won't be able to see the forest, just the individual trees. So can we solve this? Well, actually, yes. And the point is that one solution, I mean, this problem was already tackled and partly solved, I would say, in another field that has absolutely nothing to do with our transport, that is neuroscience. So in one sense, they have exactly the same problem. I don't know if you had some uh, some classes on uh, network neuroscience or similar. Probably not. Just networks, okay. But in neuroscience, they have exactly the same problem because I want to understand the brain and I want to understand, uh, understand for instance, how information is moved and processed in the brain. But the problem is that I don't have information about the micro scale. That is, I cannot have the position and the dynamics of each one of the neurons that is inside the brain, just because there are too many of them. We don't even have the computational power to process all that information. Uh, so what is the solution that they found? Well, uh, functional networks. So the idea is that instead of doing like a micro scale analysis, I record the activity of the brain in different regions, for instance, by electroencephalography. So I put a, lot, a set of sensors, maybe 32, 64, whatever, and I recorded the electrical activity of the brain in that region. And this gives me like an overview, a macro scale view of the dynamics of that region. And then what I can do is that I can take two uh, regions of the brain, I have the two time series, and now I can try to understand if they are connected or if there is information going from one to another. How, for instance, from a simple correlation to more complex uh, causalities, transfer entropy, or whatever. But the idea is that if I see that two regions of the brain are not independent, they are sharing some dynamics, then I can deduce that probably they are computing on the same function or they are contributing to the same cognitive tasks. That's quite a leap, it's quite a jump, to be honest, but it's a very good way because at the end is, I mean, is what we can do. Uh, with the data that we have and with the technology that we have. So what we can do is that we can reconstruct a network from this uh, that gives us an idea of more or less how information goes through, uh, moves throughout the, um, the computational task that we are doing, the cognitive task that we are doing. So if you think about that, it's more or less the same in uh, transport. We can do something similar. So let's suppose that we consider two airports, Madrid and Paris. 
What we can do is that we cannot simulate the movement of each individual aircraft. I don't want to do that, but we can extract an overview of the dynamics at both airports. That can be time series of average delays, for instance, per hour. So I have one time series for Madrid, and then I have one time series for, uh, for Paris. And then what I can try to do is to detect whether there has been a propagation of this information. So if I see that every time that I'm in Madrid, I have a huge increase in delays because of something, after two hours, I have a huge increase in Paris because of something, uh, because of something that I don't know, what I can deduce is probably that delays from Madrid are propagating to Paris. Yeah, more or less. I mean, there, there are some caveats. It's not that it's simple, but I'm simplifying. And it seems that once you have that, what you can do is that you can reconstruct the full network. You can do the same process for each pair of airports that you have, and then you create a nice network of, of the propagation of secondary delays. These are not delays. You are not looking at which is the airport that most produce delays. No, no, you are looking at the airport that is most transmitting delays to other ones. We actually did that a few years ago. This is a network for China. You have like the full network that is a little bit complicated to analyze. And then you have like the top 30 airports. Uh, once you have this, you can calculate some topological metrics. Um, most importantly here, you have the out degree and the out degree on the left and in degree to the right against the uh, number of flights. So the most important thing here is that this is a kind of L. So the airports that are smaller, they have the largest number, the largest out degree. It means that small airports are sending out the delays through the networks. Now, this is quite interesting because one may think, well, the problems are usually large airports, right? I mean, if you have problems in Barajas, you have a lot of delays. True, but the point is that in Madrid Barajas is a huge airport and therefore you have a lot of resources and you have a lot of buffers. In small airports, you don't have that luxury. So imagine that you are in Bay Area, you have an aircraft that is arriving or a flight and it's super delayed, like three hours. What can I do? I can take another aircraft. I forget about this aircraft, I take another aircraft because it's my headquarters, therefore I have a lot of aircraft. I take another one, another crew, okay, rush here, please make this flight and I recover some delays. If I arrive here to Palma and I have a delay, uh, uh, what can I do about it? Nothing, the next flight will also be delayed. So small airports have huge problems in terms of recovering delays just because they don't have the resources. While large airports, it's true they are more problematic and whatever, but usually they can recover better. They have at least the possibility of recovering delays. Uh, this was, uh, okay, these are more, ah, this is by airlines, but I will just skip this. This was confirmed a few years later. There were other studies that analyzed the same network. And as you can see also here, they have a similar shape. Another study with a similar shape, this is more like marked, more like uh, uh, harsh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, and then we say, okay, the three that we have seen are for China, uh, because for some reasons I had data for China and uh, I don't remember why exactly, but I had those data. And then we said, okay, why don't we do it also for Europe? So we did it uh, with another PhD student of mine, Luisina, and what we got is something that is the opposite. Because in this graph, here you have the average, uh, uh, the average degree. No, sorry. Yeah, but here you have the number of flights, but here is the ranking in the network according to the degree. So if you are the airport with most connections, you will be number one in the ranking, and therefore you will be here. So this is the opposite relation. That's Take into account that. So what we see is that the opposite. He, in this case, the most important airports are the one with the largest number of flights, which is weird, but maybe it's something of our data or something that we did that is that is wrong. Well, actually, there was another paper last year that they did the same for the US and they found the same. So this is interesting, and actually, I don't have an answer. Uh, on one hand, this analysis that I presented is good in the sense that we are able to extract some information from the system that is not trivial at all, that you have, we have no other way essentially to analyze the system like this. And results are interesting and they make us think and they may give us a solution or they give, me, give us, uh, let's say, a way that we have to follow to reach a solution. 
But the problem is that there are some differences. Like for instance, in these studies, it seems that China has a very different dynamics than US and Europe. But why is that? It's because the systems are different. And actually the Chinese system is likely different because it's more regulated than the European one and for sure than the US one. So maybe you may expect that to be the reason, but it may also be that the data that we use, they are not the same. They are collected in a different way. It may be that the tools that we have used, even if it's just grand of causality or correlation, maybe they have, we have pre-processed the data in some way that creates the difference. So that's one of the big problem. We don't have, this field is not mature enough. So we don't have a set defined standards, you know, of you have to do this and this in order to get to the results because this is evolving. These are very recent results. And so we don't know exactly what is the best way of doing things. And especially we don't know if we are doing something different, what are the consequences? So we don't know right now if the problems that we see, the difference that we see are due to something of the data, something of the way we have processed them, or because there are really differences in the, in the system between China and Europe and the US, which, can, which could be. So this is a little bit the point. Uh, I wanted to go to how much time do I have? Because I think I'm very five minutes. Okay, I will write over it and really rush. So we have seen like a, a few examples of what you can do on a macro scale that is using networks, but you can go down to time individual time series, like at one airport, or we will see at the end just one flight. So there are several like different levels. So time series analysis, there are just a few works in which essentially they've tried to understand, for instance, the entropy of landing events at one airport. And the idea is that, what is the general idea? You may think that if you have a high entropy, it means that the events are essentially random. If you have a low entropy, it means that there are some patterns inside the data, inside the landings. And therefore, maybe that there are some inefficiencies because maybe it's not used, the airport is not completely used at some time, and so forth. So ideally, you would like to see something like a noise just going on this time series. So there are a couple of works, but these are very nice example of the opposite of what we have seen before. So 15 years ago, there were a bunch of people coming from statistical physics that probably don't understand a lot about aeronautics. So they applied their tools and they got some results. But the problem is that from the aeronautical point of view, these results were not really useful because you know there are more things that you have to know about the system. This is the exactly opposite problem. This is of someone that knows a lot about air transport, but not a lot about entropies and all of that. So what they did was they took time series of arrivals at one airport for two days, not many data, and uh, they plot this the evolution of the entropy as a function of the length of the time series, which is something that I could understand, but is a little bit weird, if you know what I mean. I mean, it's not the best way of doing this kind of analysis. And they find a set of entropies, of course, and evolution. Actually, the, the shape is quite interesting, by the way, but they didn't go into that. But essentially, they saw an entropy that was around 0 0.5, between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5, and then they say, well, this is the exact values of the entropies of, I don't remember which chaotic map, therefore airports are chaotic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, but that's chaotic, but because of me, it's not right. I mean, it's not that simple. But this is another problem that, you know, you have pro people that know a lot about aeronautics, that they discover about entropy, they just apply. No, it's not that simple. You have to understand, and this is not really something that you can do. I mean, you have to work a little bit more. So this was an example. Then there is a, this other example more recent, two years ago, in which they calculated the entropy. But it was nice because they essentially coarse-grained the time series in different windows of different lengths. And so they saw that there was a minimum at 12 hours. So if you consider windows of 12 hours and the number of flights that you got inside, this was more or less regular, which makes sense. But then they saw also that there was a maximum here for 24 hours. And they, uh, which is weird because it's like one day. But it seems that this is related because there is were data from China that in the summer in China, they have huge uh, weather phenomena like uh, uh, monsoons, I think, or something like that. So they might have airports like closing for one full day because of weather events. And so they, 
it seems that is they have a lot of variability on a daily basis because of that. And then they also have these nice peaks here that corresponds to integer hours. And this seems to be related to the fact that uh, the capacity of airports is declared as number of flights per hour. And therefore, you have limited the number of flights that will arrive or take off each hour. And therefore, here what you are seeing is exactly this structure that every hour you try to put 30 flights in something, and then you have a regularity because it's like every hour is exactly that. So this was a nice idea. And actually they compare different airports and they saw that there are like different types of airports and that you can use this kind of tools to classify airports and their dynamics. So this was a, a nice idea. And then there are a couple of works that try to calculate, to go a little bit more, uh, more complicated on uh, fractal and multifractal analysis. Here they calculated the Hertz exponent and on delays at departure, and they got a 0 0.7, which is quite nice. It means that there is a trend. I mean, there is like a, that essentially when you start having delays, these will start multiplying, which is actually what we've seen before with the, with the reactionary delays. So these results make sense. And also this is another study in which they show that also the host exponent was between 0 0.76 and 0 0.79 for Europe and US which also makes sense. That's great. And uh, one last a couple of slides, I promise to be fast, about interaction between uh, flights, between aircraft. So we are going to the smallest possible level. Hopefully not this small like this uh, to packed. But essentially the idea is that there are events, for instance, in, uh, in air transport that are quite important and they are called loss of separation. And this is when two aircraft are flying and they get too close to each other. Of course, we don't want that because at the end they will probably collide. So you want that's why we have, we have air traffic controllers there just to avoid this kind of situation. But when two aircraft get too close together, this is called a, a, a conflict or a loss of separation. So here we have two examples, two trajectories. These two aircraft were getting together. Here the air traffic controller took a decision and moved one of them away, and therefore there was no safety hazard there, everything was okay. And here we have two flights that were like flying together all the time. This was not a very safe situation. So what we did a few years ago was an analysis based on network in which essentially we took a snapshot of the system near this event. And then, and then we reconstructed a network where each node was a different aircraft. And we connected two of them if their pairwise the distance was below a given threshold. So you can see these as interactions between aircraft that are too close together than what they should be. And the nice thing is that you can reconstruct one network of these for each event that you have. We had a lot of events and then we could make some statistics. And for instance, see that here you have the distributions. It probably you won't see very well from, uh, from the, the back part, but essentially there are differences in some topological metrics. And especially what we see is that uh, bad events, so events that resulted in a loss of separation, uh, usually have a lower number of connected components of greater size and with in higher internal cohesion. So they are like strongly connected between them. And this, then we were talking with our traffic controllers and they, they say, yeah, well, we know the situation. It's the typical situation in which you have flights together, flying together, but separated, such that you don't have, you cannot just focus on one part of the screen or the radar, but you have to keep moving your attention, splitting your attention between different groups that are evolving together. And this is a nightmare for them because they have, it's like multiplying their workload. So it's a very complex situation. And we could show that with complex network, you can like describe the system and get the same result. Uh, another work that we did uh, recently, actually very recently, uh, it's uh, this one in which we did something similar, but a much larger scale. So we will create a network where each node is an aircraft and we connect pairs of them if their pairwise distance is below a given threshold. But now not just for a single event, but we calculated the temporal network for the world Europe. So 20,000 flights, and uh, you can just imagine how computationally intensive that was because you have all the trajectory of the aircraft, you have to match them, you have to try. So it was quite a nightmare, but we could do that. This is an example of a network that came out, of course, you don't see anything, so don't worry about that. But the important point is that we were able to extract some topological metrics and evolution of the topological metrics. And we saw some interesting things, like for instance, that 
the network is less connected uh, in uh, when we consider real trajectories, that is trajectory real, really flown by aircraft, and it's more connected when we consider planned trajectory. Because of course, here you see the, the impact of the air traffic controllers that try to separate aircraft. Still, perturbation, because we call this kind of perturbation or interaction, they can propagate in the network in the same way. And also, they have, there are a lot of, there is a very strong community structures, such that in theory, if you can delete just a few flights, I mean, not delete the flights, but delete their interactions, um, you, can, you could, in principle, like separate the network very nicely in different regions and therefore avoid the propagation of whatever disturbance that you have in the system. So sorry that it was very fast, this last part, but just in simple ways, uh, what I hope you, you have seen is that air transport, I think, is very nice, probably because it's a nice, I mean, flying is something that at least I enjoy a lot. I don't know you. Um, and it's a very useful also in society. Just think on the economic impact, uh, mobility, connecting regions like islands. For instance, here we are in an island. I mean, it's essential. Air transport is essential. But also, it's a very complex system, complex in our sense of statistical physical sense, and uh, there are a lot of things that can be done there. On the other side, on the other hand, it's a little bit complicated because you have to understand, if you know a lot about statistical physics, you also have to understand what are the problems of our transport and be able to adapt to them and understand what is important there and the other way around. But I think that there are a lot of things that are interesting and especially in the future there will be even more studies so if in the future here we have my names if in the future we are working on some tools or whatever we are calculating something and suddenly you are in an airport and you are also late because there is a delay and you think maybe we could apply this technique to this data send me an email and we can discuss of course <laughs> okay and that's all from my side Maybe ask questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we use uh, we usually use uh, or I personally use Granger causality. So it's a metric of causality that gives you the directionality of the causality. So a link will be like. Uh, uh, the time series, the delays at these airports, uh, they seem that they are causing the delays at that other airport. Uh, there are other studies that use, for instance, correlation, linear correlation, and in that case, you don't have directionality. So for me, they are not that useful. But usually, uh, the, the best uh, solution is to use some causality metric to detect this. More? Perhaps? About what is the how to communicate with people outside the academia, uh, like pure science, I would say. Yeah. Like, how was for you to say, like, yes, like, using network theory or. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't put me on that. <laughs> no, I, saw, I was talking with a, with a friend, a colleague in, uh, in London, and he said, yeah, because we have to find ways of simplifying these kind of messages so that policymakers and politicians can understand that. And, and I said, uh, maybe we should change politicians. I mean, <laughs> no, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because uh, also, I mean, there is a, how to say, there is a, an inertia coming from the fact that they don't understand these techniques. They don't want to understand. I mean, they, they have to learn them if they want to understand the results. And also in that transport, there is a huge problem that is uh, safety. So safety is not a problem, of course. It's something that we want. But safety is a perfect excuse to block whatever you don't want. So you make any analysis, and uh, you find that the solution to reduce delay is to do something. You, won't, you don't want that. I'm not sure about the safety of this solution. Yeah. And everything is covered. So yeah, yeah, it's quite complicated. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, most of the time, uh, how how to say it? We actually have a work on that in which we try to detect the nonlinearity. We saw that in many cases it is linear, and in some cases it, it is not. Usually, it's like either like a superlinear or sublinear. 
uh, does this invalidate the user or the user of the Granger causality? Not necessarily. Let's say that we depict the linear part of the propagation. We lose the nonlinear part. And actually, we have a work in which we try to compare like a linear and nonlinear measure and try to see the difference between the two networks. So we could discuss about that. But yeah, it's a good point. It is not always linear. And sadly, most of the time is above linear. So it's like if you have a delay, not just it propagates, but it multiplies itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you could do that. Yeah, actually, I have a paper of a couple of years ago in which I compared different metrics, and uh, uh, so you could do that. Yes, the problem is that transparent entropy has also its own limitation. Yeah, to the, decide several things like the beans that you use and so forth. So it's not that simple, but you could. Yes. Yes, yeah, 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 there are other. also Granger causality has a lot of problems. And you may even say that Granger causality is not a causality. So, <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about information propagation or whatever, or interactions, if you want, between airports. Yeah. Yeah, this is complicated, but not just that, even how you reconstruct the time series. Uh, this may this affects actually how the results get. So it's this a large topic. Let's say not it's not simple. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.